My name is Andy Bikos. I'm the uh, ASME Legislative Fellow in uh, Congressman Tom Reed's office, who along with uh, Tim Ryan, uh, chairs the House Manufacturing Caucus, so welcome. Um, Congressman Reed sends his regrets for not being able to join us today. Um, as most of you are probably aware, today the tax reform uh, bill came out, so there's um, a lot of activity going on around that. Um, I want to welcome you to our topic today, Supplying Ingenuity, Sustaining and Growing U.S. Manufacturing and Jobs in Advanced Fuel-Efficient Vehicles, Components, Materials, and Technology. Um, I want to thank uh, Zoe Lippman of the Blue-Green Alliance. She's Director of Vehicle and Advanced Transportation Program, and uh, she helped, uh, actually she did help, uh, she did get this all set up. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming and for those staffers that are here. If your member is not a member of the caucus, please encourage them to join. And then uh, I'll just, uh, with no further ado, turn it over to Zoe and she's going to moderate this panel. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andy, and, and a real thank to, thanks to uh, Andy and to Saeed from uh, uh, Congressman Ryan's office for being extremely helpful in putting this together and uh, to uh, holding a whole set of these kinds of forums on, on manufacturing issues that uh, face us today, which uh, I think everyone at this panel is uh, very interested in. Um, we are uh, facing a trans transformation in the automotive sector. We've seen uh, an example in this sector of rebuilding American manufacturing and bringing back jobs at the same time as the industry has achieved deep pollution reductions and addressed uh, our, our climate and pollution challenges at the same time. That's in addition to building fabulous cars and trucks, addressing our energy security, and uh, delivering billions in savings uh, to consumers. Um, and that uh, transformation didn't happen by accident. It happened as a result of a decade of sound policy created, uh, enacted, believe it or not, here inside the Beltway by Congress, by the agencies, as well as a decade of tremendous innovation and investment um, by companies across uh, the automotive supply chain, many of whom are here today. And the question in front of us is to today is, how do we keep this momentum going? And to help answer this question, um, and to give a picture of what this transformation in the industry uh, means to companies across the supply chain, to communities across America, um, we are joined today by a tremendous panel. Um, between them, they have decades of experience in the automotive sector, in design, uh, engineering, uh, business, and on the shop floor, as well as um, uh, decades of experience in uh, energy and technology policy. And so with that, I want to just introduce our speakers um, uh, and um, then uh, give you a little sense of how the process today will roll out. We have to my right, Lori Holmes, who's Senior Director of Environmental Policy for the Motor and Equipment Manufacturers Association, or MEMA. Josh Nasser, the Legislative Director of the United Auto Workers, the UAW. Uh, John Thomas, who's Director of Global Marketing Automotive for Arconic. Luis Canales, who's Executive Director of Global Government Affairs for Next Tier. Dan Boone, who's President of the United Steelworkers Local 979 in Cleveland, Ohio. And Jack Hefner, president of uh, USW Local 2 in, I believe it's Akron, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And finally, on the end, Chris Miller, executive director of the Advanced Engine Systems Institute, AESI. They're a tremendous panel. Um, and we are going to, uh, the way to the, the uh, event today will run is that each member of the panel is going to speak briefly, five minutes or so. Um, we're going to follow that with a little bit of facilitated back and forth discussion with this really interesting panel. Um, and then we'll open it and we'll leave a significant time for questions um, from, the, from the audience. And hopefully, we've got a smallish group. We can really have some back and forth uh, uh, about how we go forward here. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to quick kick off real quickly with a few uh, comments myself um, about uh, some of the work uh, and a report in particular that it gives a name to this uh, session that we put out uh, uh, just uh, this June. So uh, real briefly, um, uh, in June, uh, the Blue Green Alliance, uh, where I'm director of Vehicles and Advanced Transportation Program, um, and the Natural Resources Defense Council put out a report called Supplying Ingenuity, um, which uh, asked uh, the question, or attempted to answer the question, what has the move, the move to much more fuel efficient vehicles meant to, the, to jobs and manufacturing across the United States? Um, and rather than modeling, um, the, uh, modeling the jobs impacts, we went out and looked across the US to ask, um, uh, to, to, to find uh, manufacturing and engineering facilities and the jobs making today, making the technologies that specifically are uh, uh, directly connected to improving fuel efficiency and reducing emissions in today's vehicles. And um, what we found was more than 1,200 factories across 48 states 288,000 manufacturing and engineering workers building these technologies today. And as you can see here, a look at the jobs in 335 congressional districts. Um, these, these jobs and manufacturing were uh, all types of manufacturing across all parts of the country. Um, and the reason I raise this is that folks sometimes think Oh, you know, we've got electric vehicles in, in California and conventional powertrain in, in, in Michigan. And what we found was something very different. We found in a state like Indiana that long had it been a leader in uh, uh, heavy trucking. Of course, we found uh, engine and heavy duty engine and transmission innovators in, in Indiana. But we also found dozens of suppliers in the hybrid and electric powertrain. Um, in Ohio, we saw advanced uh, materials manufacturing. In South Carolina, we saw innovation in, in the next generation of SUVs and trucks, as well as in advanced materials. In South Carolina, we saw uh, turbochargers, as well as electric bus. Um, what you see here is just a picture of, of the facilities we saw in, in Ohio and in South Carolina, just as two examples. The blue is the facilities as a whole. The color gives you a breakdown of components versus electric powertrain <coughs> versus uh, you know, advanced materials. And you'll see there's a mix in almost any state in the nation. Um, what we also found was two and a half times as many facilities and almost twice as many workers as in a similar uh, uh, study that was done in 2011. Um, Qualitatively, what we saw was uh, enhanced, deepened, speeded investment, enhanced innovation. Um, and uh, you know, the, often you see that in terms of uh, statistics. What we saw, to, uh, saw was uh, consistent uh, stories of uh, retooled factories and jobs brought back to communities across the country. Our conclusion was that the strong long-term standards we've had uh, on fuel economy and greenhouse gas emissions for uh, the, the uh, vehicle sector have been critical and have boosted the automotive recovery, and they're critical to sustaining it. That's obviously in addition to the benefits they bring uh, to, the, uh, to the environment, to consumers, and to our energy security. Um, by contrast, stepping away from these standards could put some of our jobs and manufacturing progress at risk. Looking forward as, as uh, countries across the globe in Europe and Asia are asking how do we capture the next generation of vehicle technology, we, uh, our conclusion was threefold. And we'll hear from the rest of the panel whether folks, how other folks are looking at this. But A, we absolutely need to continue a trajectory of, of, of strong and globally leading standards. And we need to couple that with the manufacturing, tax, trade, and other policies that help us keep and grow manufacturing of that advanced technology here in, in the US. And we need to ensure that we have strong, uh, uh, uphold strong labor rights and protections, health and safety, et cetera, to ensure 
that uh, the jobs we build deliver good jobs to Americans across the country. And so with that, I would uh, love to um, lead, uh, hand over to Lori, and um, let's hope I can quickly get her slides up here. So I'm Laurie Holmes with Motor and Equipment Manufacturers Association, or MEMA. So just so everyone understands who MEMA is, MEMA represents over 1,000 motor vehicle suppliers. Across the U.S., we represent original equipment suppliers and also aftermarket suppliers. Um, one fact that a lot of people don't know is that suppliers um, supply 77% of the value of a new vehicle. Um, we're very proud of that statistic. Um, it also includes, of course, all these very important emission technologies and fuel efficient technologies that are so important for the OEMs to have to meet these greenhouse gas and fuel efficiency standards. So just a little bit about suppliers as a whole. We're the largest manufacturing sector of jobs in the U.S. Uh, we employ 871,000 workers. 4.26 million of indirect and direct jobs. Um, a lot of that might just be numbers for you guys, but to put it into perspective, um, out of the entire auto sector, uh, Center for Automotive Research um, estimates that there's 7.25 million um, across the board in the auto sector. Suppliers make up 44% of those jobs compared to auto manufacturers that make up just 33%, and then auto dealers who make up 22%. Um, the statistic that we're very proud of is that from 2012 to 2015, the supplier industry jobs grew 19%. Even higher was the original equipment suppliers, which grew 23% from 2012 to 2015. We, and the 19% is three times larger growth than any other manufacturing sector <coughs> in the country. Um, and we feel like that, in part, can be contributed to the long-term investments that suppliers have been making since that 2012 rule, setting the greenhouse gas standards and the fuel efficiency standards from 2017 to 2025. So one thing that's very, very, oh, just one more thing with the jobs, it, though we put up that great map that shows everywhere where the suppliers are, um, our data too follows that um, trend. It's uh, our largest states, our employment states are Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Um, a lot of people think of it as a Midwest industry. It's absolutely not. Our biggest growth area is the Southeast. Um, it now encompasses one-third of all supplier jobs, and we employ workers in all 50 states. We're very proud of that, too. So Zoe also pointed out, um, you know, supplier investments are very important. That's one reason why policy is so important for suppliers, long-term certainty. Um, this is a, a quick slide on that kind of gives you a visual of everything the supplier has to go through when it's developing certain products including emissions and fuel efficiency products for the, for the OEM. So all of these stages, it can vary greatly in the time, depending on the product and depending on a lot of the variables. But sometimes these can be from anywhere from six months to two years for each stage. And suppliers don't get paid until that very last stage of product manufacturing. So this is a very long process. Um, suppliers have to start planning and investing in research and development very early. Um, and so that long-term certainty is very important. It's also important that, you know, those standards were set in 2012 for 2017 through 2025. Um, and any change in the lifetime of a product being deployed or any change in um, the delay of a product being deployed is significant ramification to the supplier. So that's why we always advocate for regulatory certainty on the emission standards and fuel efficiency standards. Okay, so this is my last slide. This isn't the best visual, I'll admit, but it's the best one I could come up with, is that suppliers are very, um, <clears throat> we like to focus on the importance of global competition. U.S., as you can see from this chart, has kind of been leading the way in the um, 
efficiency and greenhouse gas standards, and that is so important for the investments in the U.S. to be made, the research and development to be made in the U.S., and the um, intellectual property. So if the standards are somewhat weakened and it, China takes the lead or EU t takes the lead on these um, leading the way, uh, U.S. companies will lose that global competition edge that it has right now. And remember that suppliers, while a lot of them are American companies, are all global companies. They have footprints um, in Europe and China and Japan. And if those standards shift and the um, other areas are leading the way, they can just um, shift that investment in research and development to other markets that have those stricter standards. So those are the, the three um, big issues that uh, MEMA has when we're advocating for these um, greenhouse gas emission standards and the fuel efficiency standards. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Wonderful. No. Thanks very much, Lori. I, <laughs> we've, we've got Alexander. such a uh, robust panel here, as well as uh, robust standards, that <laughs> it's a little hard to uh, get uh, uh, back and forth. Are you going to speak from there, Josh? I'll speak okay. from here. Yeah. Josh, from here. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Zoe, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks everyone for being here today. I'm glad we're here to discuss this important topic. Uh, just wanted to, you know, uh, share a couple things from uh, United Auto Workers' perspective. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that the sometimes the idea that's thrown out there that there's a choice: either you have environmental standards or you have robust job growth. Um, that's a false choice, um, and we know that firsthand because we have, you know, we are proud of the role we played in establishing standards in the first place. And we have seen that when you have innovation, new technologies, th that means jobs. So we have seen that growth in jobs and strong environmental standards are not in conflict inherently. And I think that often you hear, um, you know, uh, some of our leaders kind of posit that theory. And I just want to tell you we wholesale reject it. We also think it's really important that, um, you know, that we all do our part here as far as uh, um, addressing climate change. I think there's, you know, there, there's really no scientific, de credible scientific debate on it. It's very real. Um, you know, we, we were seeing that firsthand. Um, and we all have to do what we can. But again, our support for environmental standards does not just come from, um, you know, our concern for the uh, the overall welfare of of the planet and, and people. It's also in our, in our own interest because as already has been discussed, um, we're, in a, we're in a global marketplace here. And if we as a country choose to ignore what's going on everywhere else and look backwards, um, we're gonna fall behind and, our, and we're not gonna be building the vehicles of the future. Really worried actually that we're not gonna be building the vehicles of the future if we don't, um, you know, really make a deliberate effort here uh, to have coherent policy. So for us, what's really um, uh, a concern is that um, we are seeing um, a real lack of um, the quality of a lot of the jobs that we're seeing in the industry, frankly, are not what they used to be. We're proud of the fact that a lot of manufacturing jobs that we help establish are brothers and sisters to steel workers, um, you know, middle class jobs, manufacturing middle class jobs um, with good retirement, um, good, good uh, wages, benefits, working conditions. And we've really seen that slip, slip in a major, major way. Um, you know, I've seen some estimates from, I believe, uh, NELP that about a quarter of manufacturing jobs, and that's not just the auto, but in, in total, you know, they're under $12 an hour at this point. So, um, you know, we're really seeing a lot of the jobs that used to be solid middle class jobs not be. And we're seeing a lot of companies, unfortunately, not even hiring their, their workers um, directly. They're using temp agencies to hire folks. And you see some plants where people will work side by side, you know, full, quote unquote, full time employees with temporary, but they have the same job, except the temporary employee uh, gets paid much less and has worse benefits. But if you went in the plant, you wouldn't see any difference. You wouldn't know. But the difference is in who sends the check. So there's some real um, there's some real issues going on here as far as needing to make these jobs um, 
you know, better, better jobs. I think that's really important. And we've also seen some attacks on health and safety standards. Um, laws have already been weakened this year on health and safety standards. That's really uh, disturbing because in our collective bargaining contracts, we don't just negotiate um, wages and benefits, but also health and safety uh, conditions and scheduling and, and things like that. So I think it's really important as we look forward here that we have, we try to maintain a unified approach on dealing with um, fuel, fish, caffeine, GHG standards. Um, and uh, we think we need, we do need one national program, one standard, but we think that it's really important that um, it be an aggressive standard. We also think it needs to be realistic and, and have some flexibilities built in uh, because we're not in a static world. Um, things change dramatically. Oil prices, you know, rise and fall big time and, and things like that. Um, but we really want, we've always played a role at UAW at, at building the cars of the future. We embrace change. We embrace new technology. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. But I, I really think it's incumbent on um, the Congress policymakers and, and all of us to really um, address this in a comprehensive way and try to not make this a political football. It really, it really shouldn't be. It doesn't need to be. So, um, I, and it's not in our interest, frankly, having uncertainty around standards and not knowing where we're heading. That's not good for, for our economy. It's not good for our members, um, quite frankly, and our retirees. So we're, we're proud of the role we've played in, in the rebound of this industry, and we need to keep it going. Um, and uh, there's no reason that we can't have um, maintained to be the, the world leader uh, in this industry. And... Um, but that's going to take a real commitment for everyone to work together. Um, and we have a lot of work to do for that to happen. So um, look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Josh. And I now turn it over to uh, John Thomas from Arconic. I'm going to stand up because I sit all the time. <laughs> I'm going to take your chair and your drink. <laughs> Thanks, Zoe. Um, so my name is John Thomas. I'm the director of global marketing for Arconic. And before we get started, don't be bashful. How many people in here have heard of Arconic? Good. More than I thought. How many people in here have heard of Alcoa? Lots more, right? So Arconic, one year ago today, or one year ago yesterday, actually separated from Alcoa. So we are basically the downstream operations of what used to be Alcoa. So we're the people who make the sheet aluminum, or the people that make fasteners and forgings and castings, right? So if you think aluminum now and you think of product form, it's Arconic. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about me and the coolest job, I have the best job in the world. My job is to tell our management and confirm with my, our management what we should do, where we should do it, when we should do it, and how we should do it to help our company, our employees, and our customers succeed. So. Aluminum's been in the news a lot in the last several years. How many have heard of the F-150, the Ford F-150? Come on, guys. I know you guys have. <laughs> so the F-150 is certainly a huge success story in the use of advanced military-grade aluminum in a high manufacturing situation in automotive. And it's one thing to build you know, an airplane. That's certainly a lot of aluminum. It's another thing to build a car. Right, where you're making 700,000 F-150s a year. It's amazing how quickly these things roll off the line. So what does aluminum do for automotive, right? We've talking about greenhouse gas emissions. Aluminum is one of the cleanest ways to do it because it comes from hydropower. It's very, very clean from a um, global perspective, from an environmental perspective. The other thing aluminum does is it's a lot lighter than steel, right? So what does that give you? It gives you a multitude of benefits. One of the biggest things it does is it helps our customers meet the CAFE standards with fuel efficiency. It's important to all of us that we want to spend as little money as possible when we fill up the tank of our CT6 or our Chrysler Pacifica or our F-150 or any Nissan program which we happen to supply those programs. But it's not just about fuel efficiency, right? It's about performance. When we hit the gas pedal, we want that thing to go. Right? We want it to go fast, we want it to stop fast, we want it to be safe, <clears throat> we want it to tow and haul and carry our families around as safely as possible. The current F-150 in aluminum is safer crash-wise than the last vehicle. 
So aluminum's light, aluminum's strong, and what can it do to help our customers? What it is is it's an enabler, right? It's not just about the weight savings from aluminum in and of itself. It's making the efficiency of the engines better, right? A lighter vehicle doesn't need as much engine power to perform the same way or better than it did before. It's stronger, it's lighter, it's ultimately it's, it's all about increasing the performance of the vehicle and the efficiency of the vehicle. Battery range in electric vehicles is very, very important, right? A lighter vehicle is going to get further range. We all want that, right? So how do we do this, right? We've got just a ton of manufacturing in North America and around the world. In North America, we have 23,000 jobs. <coughs> About almost 20% of those jobs are at two facilities, one in Davenport, Iowa, and one in um, Knoxville, Tennessee. Actually, the town is called Alcoa, Tennessee. It's, it's, a, it's a storied company with a rich and diverse history with regard to employment in the United States. We're growing. We put $300 million in investment in our Davenport, Iowa facility, $300 million of investment in our Tennessee facility. Um, it's been a dramatic shift. We are growing with our customers, and it's about providing jobs, technology, and ultimately the products that our customers want to make the products that we in this room all want. So Arconic is heavily involved in automotive, obviously. We're also involved heavily in aerospace. That's, those are the two main product focuses that we have as a company. So we supply everything from aluminum sheet to <coughs> high technology fasteners to wheels um, it, it's really the breadth and depth of the transportation industry around the world and specifically uh, in North America. So I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to get questions. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. But if, when you walk away today, I want you to remember Arconic and Aluminum. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. <coughs> I'll fly back over here and uh, I'm going to sit down Louis. to keep yeah. the pattern. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> introduce Luis. And uh, it's from next year. Uh, good afternoon. Um, again, I'm Luis, and uh, I've been in the automotive industry for about 30 years. So today I'm going to give you a little background about our, our company, tell you about our products and the impact that our technology has had in jobs in the United States. So um, next year, we like to think of ourselves as a leader in intuitive motion control with a core business focus on steering systems and driveline systems. Um, these systems include uh, driver assist systems, uh, or ADAS, and autonomous vehicle technologies for the automotive industry. Uh, we employ over 13,000 people globally in 12 countries uh, and in 25 manufacturing locations, serving over 50 original, original equipment vehicle manufacturers. So with this global focus as background, I also want to say that next year is proud of our Midwest roots. Uh, Midwest is where you know, the automotive uh, history started in the United States. Uh, going back to 1906, when our company was established in Saginaw, Michigan. We have the distinction of being the only Tier 1 global steering supplier that is based in the United States. We had other competitors that had been acquired by uh, overseas companies, uh, but our headquarters remain in Auburn Hills, Michigan. Today we employ 5,400 people in Michigan, and the majority of them are in Saginaw County, uh, which is the uh, county where I live. Uh, that is the home of our Global Technology Center and of our North America division. Of those 5,400 people, about 3,200 of them are represented by our business partners from UAW Local 699, and we're very proud of that. So in, in 2010, uh, we were purchased um, out of bankruptcy from Delphi Corporation, uh, and uh, since then, next year has created over 2,400 U.S. jobs. And if you do the math, that's about an increase of about 80% jobs uh, since 2010. We have, we have also invested uh, more than $500 million in productive equipment in the U.S. And of that, nearly $130 million has been in the last couple of years. The investment in job creation has been driven primarily by our fuel-efficient electric power steering, or EPS, not to be equated to earnings per share, but electric power steering. <coughs> and electric power steering improves fuel efficiency uh, between 2 and 6%. So um, estimates of what that uh, means to the powertrain, that equates to about 500 pounds uh, of weight shed off from the vehicle. 
So that's the efficiency that our electric power steering provides by eliminating the hydraulic, the traditional hydraulic power steering system. Um, and this system has been developed by our more than a thousand US-based engineers working at our global tech center. You see, with the brains, the sensors, and the muscle, EPS is also the foundational technology that steers the future of connected and autonomous vehicles, whether it has a driver or a machine behind it. So uh, we're really looking forward to where autonomous vehicles are going to go. And we're very, very excited to be part of that ongoing transformation <coughs> and appreciate the support and consideration of uh, the congressman that you represent um, and your continued support for the uh, autonomous vehicle legislations that are under consideration that, that will enable also industry participants like next year to accelerate product development, time to market, right here in the U.S. Innovation is the core of our business and a necessary ingredient for continued growth and job creation in the automotive manufacturing se sector. So your support with those legislations is really greatly appreciated. But we also know that the automotive industry is highly competitive with global um, contenders that compete every day for very, very narrow margins. And that is why we're also bringing our advanced technology to bear on the manufacturing floor with a focus on quality and efficiency. We use automation side by side our highly skilled workforce. We deliver our safety critical steering systems so that they have the highest quality and reliability. And when you're talking about autonomous vehicles, that is very important. So keep that in mind. And for example, we have implemented inspection cobots. These are robots that work side by side um, with, uh, with workers. And you know, if you have the idea of a robot, you usually see them behind fenced um, um, areas. But no, these robots are aids to help increase uh, inspection and quality of our products as they go out the door. And these systems feed um, the information gained by the checks uh, and record them into our next trace, which is our best-in-class uh, traceability system. The next trace system gathers information along each step of the manufacturing process, <coughs> and it helps us improve safety and competitiveness. And by mining the big data that is gathered by our next trace system, we can identify and contain issues as they develop. And we expect that through the use of artificial intelligence, we'll be able to prevent manufacturing issues before they happen and further increase the competitive competitiveness of our business. So, you know, uh, there's more, more to share, but I welcome your questions, and we look forward to this dialogue in this panel. Wonderful. Thanks very much. And uh, with that, thanks very much, Luis. And with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dan Boo. I forgot I have to stand, though. <laughs> We don't want to break the pattern. We don't want to break the pattern. <laughs> Seems like it's working, right? Yeah, definitely. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Dan Boone. I'm the president of uh, United Steelworkers Local 979 in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm here today representing 1,600 uh, hourly workers that uh, work in our plant. And also the over 400 uh, salary workers that work, work in our plant as, as well. We work together. Uh, that's one of the reasons that our Middle Cleveland is in the situation that it is in today. And I want to thank you for your opportunity to come here and talk about the work that we do at, at Arshley Middle. You know, every day our guys go to work, and uh, one of the things we're focusing on more and more and we're becoming more and more competitive with and are the leading producer of the advanced high strength steel that is now being uh, marketed. You'll see it in commercials, you know, our, our vehicles contain the uh, new advanced light, you know, advanced high strength steel and uh, it's stronger than normal steel and someday we hope to rival the weight of our friends in the aluminum industry. And there is room for both of us in this industry. Are we competitors? Yes. 
we are competitors, but we also have the same goal in mind, and that's to make it better for the environment and for the general public. You know, everybody wants better gas mileage. Everybody wants independence from uh, from foreign, uh, you know, from foreign entities and, and the oil that they provide us. So. You know, we all benefit, and even from competition. I mean, we all have the same goal. So, you know, good luck to you, and uh, good luck to us as well. And I think, uh, I think our steel is in your uh, aluminum F-150, isn't it? I'm sure I believe, I believe that it is. So, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Hey, our plant is one of the most productive steel mills in the world. We have. Uh, one of the low for an integrated mill, the lowest man hour per ton in the world is 1.1 man hour per ton, and we rival uh, the mini mills at that. At the same time, we're also one of the cleanest mills uh, in in the world. We we sit right in the middle of downtown Cleveland, okay, and we consistently meet the environmental standards. We're monitored uh, for. Uh, emissions from our blast furnaces on a daily basis, and we uh, pass those. Uh, consistently, the water we put back in the river is five times cleaner than, than when we take it out of it. So uh, we're doing our part environmentally as well. In 2001, our plant was closed, and 90% of that was due to uh, what we in the steel industry would consider uh, uh, unfairly uh, government-subsidized imported dumped steel. And at that time in Cleveland, 3,600 active workers lost their jobs, and over throughout all of uh, at that time, LTV Steel, 30,000 uh, retirees lost their health care. Uh, since then, we're back. Uh, we now employ again 1,600 hourly workers in Cleveland, and Arsler Middle has facilities throughout Northwest Indiana as well as uh, Alabama, and. Uh, we plan on continuing that with that way, but you know we're proud to say that that our our steel is being used in uh, to help make lighter and more fuel efficient vehicles, and and one of the reasons for that is you know a, a long term sound fuel economy and the standards there will continue to bring back quality jobs, American jobs that that all all of us are doing you know. You mentioned, you know, your jobs are paying $12 an hour. You know, we're, we're above that. And and the innovation and the technology that, that comes through the quest to, to to make 50 miles per gallon someday, I hope we make that. I mean, it, it, it takes intelligence to do that. It takes it takes training and it, it takes investment. And that's a word I'd like to hear more from our company. Investment. So, you know, those investments, that's what's going to keep us going. So we know it's a strong driver. If jobs in Ohio already, there's 80 facilities and 28,000 people working in manufacturing right now in vehicle technology, including building the, the vehicles uh, in Ohio, including our plant, uh, you know, Arsenal Mill Cleveland. Uh, we've done trials for Tesla. We've recently been qualified for uh, Mercedes-Benz, one of our largest uh, uh, customers for advanced high strength is is Honda. So we we're out there all the time, and uh, our our steel is in demand. And it's important we keep these standards going to keep driving innovation. The, the, so this demand continues to grow. And today's fuel economy standards are sound proof that uh, sound regulations go hand in hand with making manufacturing thrive based on what I just said and what we heard earlier about the uh, about the wages. You know, better wages mean better economy. Economy goes up as the standard of living climbs with it. So, and, uh, you know, Ohio and the auto sector are proving while you can continue to add jobs while cutting pollution and enhance energy security. So we're all hand in hand on that as well. Our country, country continues to, you know, we need to continue to grow the middle class. I'm not making it harder for them. We need to continue to make good jobs, produce good jobs with fair wages so working families can provide for their children and save for a rainy day and, and, and invest in their communities. And that's one of the good things that we're proud of is the fact that, uh, you know, the people we represent make a good wage 
and uh, we create a good tax base out of Arsenal Middle for, for Cleveland. And Arsenal Middle is a good community citizen. They're they're involved with all the local committees, from food banks to uh, to where they you know they have community gardens. So I mean, our company as well is involved involved in the community. So we're all in on that. We also need to leave our children's children's children. I, I, I like that phrase a lot. It's not about my children, my grandchildren. It's, it's about our children's children's children. You know, a, a place then a planet they can live on. So, you know, they they can go to work and and, and come home safe too, and and continue to make a, an economy that that continues to be cleaner. So we can put this earth back into a shape where we can all afford to breathe the water, no, to breathe the air, and drink the water, no matter what country we're in. So, uh, that's going to be the foundation, you know, for generations to come and, and that that should be our goal and we should all work towards that and keeping our fuel economy standards strong will also help us achieve so simultaneously the right thing to do for our workers our economy and our environment thanks for listening to me and i'm really glad you all came today and with that, I'll turn it back over to Zoe. Sure. And I'm going to turn it right over to Jack. Are you going to stand up or are you going to sit down? I'm going to sit down. Oh, see, there we go. I'll give you back your chair. I will go this way. I really know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine because I don't have to be. Good afternoon, everybody. As Zoe said earlier, my name is Jack Hefner. I'm president of United Steelworkers Local 2 in Akron, Ohio. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, as president of Steelworkers Local 2, I represent workers at 16 manufacturers in the uh, Northeast Ohio area, and they're all building cutting-edge technologies that are helping to make our light-duty cars, trucks, and FUVs run cleaner than ever. We are part of a much larger group of workers throughout the auto industry supply chain that other speakers have talked about today, and they're building components and technology to meet clean air standards. Uh, just a couple of examples of the manufacturers that we represent I work at Maxion Wheels, and uh, we have been providing reliable products and services to every major car manufacturer for over 100 years. We're the world's largest producer of wheels. We have plants all over the world, Germany, the Czech Republic, China, India, United States. Uh, today they also make aluminum rims you can see on cars every day that are lighter, helping to keep vehicle weight down and improve fuel economy. And they're strong and stylish also. They also make, we also make functional, cost-effective, and weight-optimized steel wheels, and we do that in our uh, Akron plant truck rims. We do the Hummer military wheel in Akron also, and we have a passenger car plant in uh, Sedalia, Missouri, that does a lot of work with the Ford Motor Company. In addition, it turns out that Dan and I have more in common than being presidents of steelworkers locals. Uh, Maxion uses steel made by Arsler Middle, lightweight steel, that we use in our truck rims every day. Very cost effective and weight optimized. Uh, our, our local axle represents uh, Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, where workers recently ratified a five year contract. Goodyear is one of the world's le largest leading tire companies and manufactures tires that reduce the rolling resistance of cars by up to 27%, improving fuel efficiency while still providing traction and safety that people expect from Goodyear tires. In addition to that, Goodyear recently announced earlier this year that they're going to be able to start producing wheels using soybean oil, a, a real breakthrough instead of uh, crude oil. There's almost a quart of oil in every tire. So if you do the math. I mean, if Goodyear's going to be doing this, it, it's not going to be long before the rest of the tire industry follows suit with this, and that's going to really reduce the carbon footprint on, on crude oil. And these jobs are supported by the effort to make the vehicles drive every day more fuel efficient, more than ever. All the protecting the jobs we have and, and hopefully creating new jobs is very important. The kind of planet and environment we leave for our children and our grandchildren is also every bit as important as that. I'm here today to stand up for my fellow members and urge members of Congress to fight to keep strong fuel economy standards, to protect current jobs, and encourage more innovation and job creation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jack. And uh, with a final speaker, thanks very much. It's Chris, Chris Miller, and I believe you even have slides. Uh, I want to thank, excuse me, I want to thank Congressman Reed and Ryan in the House Manufacturing Caucus and Zoe and the Blue Green Alliance for putting this on and inviting 
uh, me to come. Uh, Chris Miller, I'm an executive director of a small trade association of emissions control and efficiency uh, technology providers. It's a subset of MEMA for the most part. I think everybody's a MEMA member. Um, uh, and they make everything from catalytic converters to thermoelectric generators to turbochargers to batteries to you, you name it, their, uh, their supply, whatever, whatever is going to help make a, uh, a car or a truck cleaner and greener uh, and more efficient. <clears throat> Um, they are, we are, our trade, our members um, have facilities in 34 states, uh, have about 70,000 people working on conventional pollution control and about another 70,000 that are working on efficiency technologies and uh, engine related types of things, not excluding them, not to exclude the materials people, but not including materials people. Um, our industry was basically created out of whole cloth. Um, around in the early 70s when people realized that air pollution needed to be controlled from vehicles and the catalytic converter was invented. From that point on, um, various and sundry re uh, um, in improvements in understanding the science and the need for controlling air quality or air pollution um, grew, grew, grew the industry substantially. And so we've helped keep the um, automakers keep their vehicles cleaner even while the number of vehicles have increased dramatically as has vehicle miles traveled. We've done that in a pretty cost-effective manner, um, especially if you compare these kinds of controls to stationary source controls that are necessary to meet science-based public health standards on the Clean Air Act. Our, uh, our industry's investment in R&D and in um, innovation has been in the billions. Um, not the same as the OEMs, but it's been substantial in order to keep pace with the innovation that's happening around uh, the country and the need for it around the world. The U.S.'s clean car standards have led the world by and large, um, for decades, both in form and in enforcement. Other countries don't do so good on enforcement. They may talk a good game, but um, I won't talk about Europe directly. Um, but the, <laughs> the, uh, this export of our standards has paved the way for the export of our products, our equipment, our intel, and, and our in innovation. They've created um, a clear competitive advantage for US innovators and, and companies. And I should say that the EPA NHTSA technical assessment report that was done some time ago is full of technologies that U.S. suppliers have developed ever since there was clarity in the 2007 Energy Policy Act and then in the 2012 Uniform or National Standards for Fuel Efficiency. Those have helped drive an amazing amount of innovation. Um, our companies, companies that, that Lori has talked about, are all hoping to deploy those standards as, as the, um, excuse me, deploy this equipment and this technology as the standards are implemented. Some of the things, however, have happened even since the 2012 standards were set in motion or the TAR was completed. Uh, Mazda sky active engines, lower cost 48 volt hybrid systems, the Miller, no relation, uh, cycled turbocharged engines, e-boost, continuously, continuously variable transmissions, the list goes on and on and on. All things that have happened really in the last 10 to 15 years. So we, they're happening here and now in the United States, creating jobs and attracting investment. But as Lori mentioned, if that starts to tail off, if the policy gets downshift or reversed, then investment will dry up. It will move rapidly to other markets that are starting to take our standards, basically our standards, and implement them um, uh, aggressively. So if, it, if our standards stagnate, um, the supplier industry will face commoditization, which meaning stuff, cheap stuff will start coming in as you, it, I don't want to, we don't talk about trade at this point in time really very much, but these standards provide a little bit of a non-tariff barrier to products and companies that want to come in and sell cheaper stuff that may not work as well. As long as we are moving forward and, and trying to reduce and emissions and, and um, innovate, we have set, we continue to set the bar that other countries and other companies outside the U.S. really can't keep up with. Um, we really need regulatory certainty and continued progress on reducing pollution to invest, to innovate, and to be profitable, um, and to deploy the technologies that are really coming to the market as we speak. We're really hoping that um, all the stakeholders that got together in the development of the 22 national uniform standards will get together again, provide clarity and certainty, maybe out to 2030 if that's possible, but we need to make continued progress for this industry to continue growing. Thank you.
Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you very much uh, to the whole <clears throat> panel. Um, and at this point, uh, well, we're going to have a little bit of a back and forth discussion here with the with the panelists. Um, but then I think open up uh, to to for to questions from the audience uh, pretty quick. Um, I guess given that we're here inside the Beltway um, and folks have talked a lot about the standards, um, but I wonder, you know, not getting too far down into the weeds, but sort of big picture, what 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 do you what do you need from Congress, from the agencies in terms of policy direction here, um, looking looking broadly? Um, is there anything that we haven't mentioned or areas? Again, not not getting into too much into tax and trade, which are uh, hot topics that I think would take a whole nother uh, panel. But looking at, at at manufacturing and innovation, anything that panelists maybe would want to add that hasn't been raised. I mean, I agree with what Josh said. You know, with regard to Cafe about the one national program, right? So it, it's important for our customers and ultimately for us and the people that we employ um, uh, you know around the world and specifically in the country about having some uh, the, specifically the one national program on, on cafe with NHTSA and EPA and CARB and, and everybody we've all got to work together here to, to make sure that you know and, and Dan mentioned it as well making sure that we're clean and green and, and efficient moving forward you know I would add also um, something that Lori mentioned uh, long-term certainty on the environment, not just regulatory, but general legislative, um, because as she mentioned, you know, we make investments up front that uh, we have to, I, I would say, make a bet that um, that certainty is going to be there five, seven years from, you know, from when we're in, actually in production. So um, that uncertainty really drives a lot of uh, um, risk if it's not there. And uh, I think uh, we can do that either in, um, in, in all, across all the areas. I don't want to get into any particular one, but across areas of regu regulatory and legislative action, uh, that's what business really needs. I know for a fact the companies that we represent, they're looking for some guidance as to what to pick up where they were talking about. What they can do, they want to have a, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, and they need some standards going forward so they can make their investments. We have a plant right now that wants to make investments in Akron in their facility, but they're they're holding back because they don't know where this stuff's going. We need an investments to keep keep growing the economy, keep growing the area in the area and create some more good good paying jobs. These are good paying jobs. And that uncertainty the cloud that's out there, they, these these companies don't have a crystal ball. I mean, they don't know what's coming. They need some they need some guidelines, they need some standards so they can make the investments that they need to make and, and, and grow their business and create good jobs for people. And I, I've been involved in, this is the second panel in, in this criteria and this arena that I've been involved in now. And, and the last one I was involved in was more of a more broad spectrum. And, and one of the things that I picked up from that and was that the ones that were most against the quest for, for 50 miles per gallon and the CAFE standards were the ones that had the most to gain if they didn't succeed. And that was, and I understand how lobbying works, and, but, you know, I, I heard a gentleman speak that day that owned a large dealership and this, this whole presentation to me felt like it was all about dollars for a few. And I would, you know, he would, people that work for dollars for a few that would be willing to put potentially a planet at risk and potential lives at risk through pollution and, you know, just money. And listen, there are three gentlemen talk about how, and, and my company, be willing to pay a decent wage and be willing to share that money with their members and, and the people, their employees. But when, when you have people lobbying on behalf of themselves and two and three small groups that would put so many lives 
further back behind in an economic basis or uh, an environmental basis, to me, is just wrong. It, it's just wrong, you know, and it just it just rubs me the wrong way, and I, I take offense to to the way the system works when you can have so many people be for something and have so few be against something and so few win because of how much money they have or how much influence they have. And they, they really don't care about us. And us, you may not feel how I do, but in the end, we all pay for it in one way or another. So, and, and I, I kind of agree with what Jack said too, you know, <clears throat> the, the, these companies, they might need some direction and we may need more information out there to help people better understand what the, what the whole thing is all about. 50 miles for you, well, we'll never get there. Well, we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, I have a 2002 Tahoe that gets 15 miles to the gallon. I seldom drive it except when I haul things around now. I've got a 2016 Jeep Cherokee that gets 32 miles to the gallon. Which one do you think I'm going to continue to drive? That's, that's what I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, did you want to? I was just going to say that the, the double whammy that's brewing, uh, the uncertainty of where the standards are going to go, um, plus the cuts in important programs for R&D, federal programs for R&D to support uh, the transformation that you're talking about so no one gets left behind, so that we're really lifting all boats in the United States at the same time to compete with the other countries <coughs> that are heavily subsidizing their auto manufacturers is, is, is a little scary, because if we're not going to use the power of the market to draw these technologies, investment in these technologies in the United States, and we're not going to do the, the, the federal investment, we're, we're going to lose a lot of jobs. Sure. Yeah, I, I wanted to, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think it just, you know, we we have to, you can't just look at the standards. You also got to look at other programs that actually incentivize, um, you know, uh, investment here, and such as the, um, you know, DOE programs like the ATVM, for example. Um, you know, the, the, we have to look at that too. Um, the other thing is we really have to, uh, you know, recognize the, the need to continue to invest in our workforce. So, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, we, our members do is we uh, establish in our collective bargaining contracts, um, you know, joint training programs and such, which allow workers to, uh, you know, to get more and more skills and more training, you know, and uh, as a, throughout their career, those kind of things are really important too, because, uh, you know, really having um, investment in, in manufacturing jobs and making manufacturing jobs, um, you know, making it clear that those are jobs with a future is really, uh, we could use a lot more leadership uh, in Washington in that direction for sure. Wonderful. Thanks, folks. Um, I'm, I, I think I'm going to, at this point, open up to the audience because I think we've touched on a lot of topics I was going to, I imagine others want to have uh, <coughs> questions for as well, and I think that might be uh, quicker than continuing to talk amongst ourselves. So if folks have questions.